everyone thanks for tuning in this is episode number 140 I want to thank you for taking the time to join me on this next episode I pray that it's a blessing and we'll just jump right in this is I just anticipate this one to be a fairly short one because I want to point out something perhaps small definitely subtle but I think impactful at least it was to me, I just really noticed this. Perhaps for the first time, I the concept of it seemed foreign. I'd never, I don't know if I've, if I've heard this before or what, but it struck me as though like it, it kind of took, kind of took my breath away. So, um, where we find today's portion is out of First Kings, chapter nineteen, and we'll read a few verses. But uh, just to give you a little context of chapter nineteen, where we find ourselves starting, just previously to this, in chapter towards the end of eighteen, we find Elijah, the prophet, who is on Mount Carmel. And there is what we could call a showdown between the prophets of Baal and the living God. And you may recall the story, but the prophets of Baal are given an opportunity to call fire down from, we'll say, from the heavens to consume a sacrifice and the one, the God, who brings fire down to consume the sacrifice is the God. And Elijah, he orchestrates this, I guess, test, if you will, this demonstration of the reality of who is the true God. I believe Elijah says, what Essentially, he says this back and forth between serving God or believing God and following God or not, it, it has to stop. There has to be a let's once and for all settle the matter. Who is the living God? So um, if you're not familiar with the story, it's a wonderful one. And many a Sunday school lesson is given with this particular story, particular framework. And the story continues, and we find that the prophets of Baal um, spend uh, the better part of a day trying to get fire to come down, and they are unsuccessful. And then Elijah prays to God a simple prayer, a honest prayer, demonstrate to these people so that they will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again, this, this, this idea of repentance. And after the, the prayer, the fire of the Lord fell. Okay, Elijah then, you know, this, the whole sacrifice is taken up by this fire that falls the the stones of the altar, the soil, the water from the f- fact that they have poured excess water on it, um, what what comes to be the sum of of twelve large jars of water are po- poured on the offering and on the wood, and the Lord burns it all up. So now Elijah. He uh, he gets he rounds up all of these prophets of Baal, and they put them to death. And Ahab is sent on ahead, and Elijah says 
to them, to Ahab, basically, you better go home and eat and drink and hurry because I hear the sound of rain coming. Now remember that this is a time of drought that um, Elijah, I believe it was, declared that there would be no rain, this drought period. Well, now he's saying after that this the number of years per, that passed i think it was 3 or 3 and a half years maybe no rain now there is a sound of rain no so there's a scene that transpires there but what i really want to get to the meat of what we're talking about just in this moment is ahab when he is now back at his place he tells Jezebel everything. Now, Jezebel is the one who was married to Ahab, a very wicked and vile woman. Ahab tells Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how that he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So that's verse 1 of 19. Verse 2 says, So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. She's talking about the prophets that were put to death. This is a threat. Verse 3, and here it is. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Now, your Bible may have a footnote um, attached to afraid. Mine does. And when you find that footnote, it informs me that it could also be said, or Elijah saw. Now that struck me interestingly because I wondered then in that moment, wait, how does that fit? Elijah saw and ran for his life. So now, and I don't, I don't know the the nuances of, uh, of maybe how to how to explain this, but perhaps some translations or manuscripts, rather, manuscripts is probably the better word, will use the phrase Elijah saw. And ran for his life. Other manuscripts may say Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And those differences may, I'm sure they they have their, uh, perhaps their reasoning for this. Maybe translators who have reviewed manuscripts feel like that the the rationale for having Elijah was afraid is fits, but maybe they just footnote the fact that some perhaps say Elijah saw. But what do you think that means, Elijah saw? Well, don't forget, Elijah was a prophet, and being a prophet, you are privy to um, visions, that the Lord would reveal to you. So no doubt Elijah had access to these ex- types of experiences. So what am I getting at or what or what am I hinting at? I think both of these components are are accurate. Elijah saw and was afraid. So what did he see? Well, I submit that he saw Jezebel murdering him or Jezebel taking his life. Now, could that be some infiltration of his mind and imagination, an attack from the enemy to to? Put him in a heightened state of fear? Sure, of course. Very possible. What if also Elijah was given the opportunity to see a thing that 
would come to pass or could come to pass. And and it made him afraid. So he ran for his life. Just take a moment to... I mean, we give Elijah a hard time because of how he responds in this moment. Remember, contextually, he just had the most powerful encounter of probably any recorded moment in perhaps the Old Testament or or maybe the whole Bible. This showdown between the fake and the real. And fire comes from heaven at the request of a of a singular man whose heart is bent to demonstrate the reality of God i mean this is an epic moment and he saw the faithfulness of god in the moment and now you're telling me that a, a woman named Jezebel sends a messenger to say, I'm going to kill you. And Elijah is terrified of that. So we give him a hard time because we think that's just ludicrous. Why in the world would he be so terrified? And his faith should be at an all-time high level. So perhaps Elijah seeing what would or could transpire gives us a little more grace to understand why he would be so terrified, why a threat like that would cause him so much disruption. Because he runs for his life, and continuing on, it says, when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Hmm. So it's interesting. He says to the Lord, I'm no better than my ancestors. Because remember, all of God's people always want to put to death the prophet. So he says, I've had enough. I don't. I don't know, and um, I'm not sure that that indeed was was a path that was going to transpire, n- namely Elijah being put to death by Jezebel. Uh, and of course, God's intervention and his ability to thwart the enemy's uh, strategy is without question god god is able but elijah was convinced and and i think we see in this in this verse take my life i am no better than my ancestors i can see in this a little bit of lord i would rather you take my life than to fall prey to the enemy's hand. That's something that I I feel like I can feel in the text. That doesn't mean that's necessarily the case, but I can imagine that being a emotion that Elijah is feeling. Now, obviously, he's also feeling fed up, right? probably always feeling like he's being chased and hunted and sought for destruction. I'm sure he's on his last straw, so to speak. So the story, the story continues on and it's, and it is quite interesting. And the Lord eventually appears to Elijah 
There's these powerful signs, winds and earthquakes and fires. But the Lord was not in those things. The Lord came in a gentle whisper because he wanted to appear to Elijah. Now, there's many, I'm sure, wonderful teachings on some of those, you know, fire, earthquake, and uh, powerful winds, and this, and some significance that they can represent. But, um, so I would encourage you to explore, explore these scriptures to unpack them, I suppose. And, and we will, we will do that maybe in some other time, but, um, what I just really wanted to leave you with in this is perhaps a a fresh perspective on Elijah's situation and maybe a new appreciation for the situation that he was in. And perhaps we can give a little grace in in this in this situation, this moment of scripture for Elijah, because maybe he had good reason to f- to flee, um, because he saw something that warranted his movement. Now we're not saying, I'm not suggesting we should respond in fear to uh, the threats of the enemy and and all that, but perhaps he saw something of himself transpiring and reacted. So I, I, I hope that that maybe piques your curiosity of something inside the text that maybe you've never seen before. I pray that's a blessing. I thank you for taking the time to join me on this episode, and I look forward to the next one. God bless. It means that I'm close to you. I would trade a million lifetimes for a moment here.